Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Mahran and CIRS, for the invitation to be here tonight. I actually gave a similar talk on uh, the same subject two weekends ago at a, an event in Kuwait made up mostly of um, Gulf nationals. And so I got some interesting feedback about um, their own view of public opinion in the Gulf region um, coming from the standpoint of citizens. I'm a senior researcher at an organization at Qatar University which has a very long name. I was joking before that, in fact, the name is worse in Arabic because the word for survey sounds a lot like Christian. And so um, if it's introduced in Arabic, some people sort of have to ask, again, what's the name? And so a lot of the Qataris at our institute want to change the name. Anyway, um, I'm a research program manager of a new unit within the center, which is oriented towards policy analysis, which is why the title here doesn't match what, um, what was said in the introduction. I want to say a few things at the beginning about the center and sort of the surveys that it conducts since apart from um, the Qatar Statistical Authority, the National Statistical Authority, we're the only um, organization conducting household surveys in the country. So uh, CESRI was established in 2008 in close association with the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research, which is a um, long-standing survey research center that does the US electoral polls and some other um, uh, well-recognized surveys. There are two primary modes of data collection. One is a household survey, which is 85% or so of our work. And just recently, we started a telephone center, which makes use of cell phones. Um, and that is, again, maybe 15% of the, the surveys we conduct. Our samples are nationally representative. We have separate subsamples for um, Qatari citizens and expatriates and migrant laborers, um, which introduces some complications, which we can talk about later. Respondent sizes for surveys go anywhere from 800 to 4,000 individuals. The frames themselves come from um, originally from Kahrama, which is the electricity and water, which has been updated over the years by Cessary itself as, as new um, housing units have come online and as, as, as things have been updated. So we don't rely on anyone else to draw samples. We can do that in-house. We are a fairly um, busy organization despite being small. So we, we currently um, have about 10 projects per year, household surveys and three projects, phone surveys. Um, so that's a lot of projects for what is, again, a fairly small center. They're mainly academic, some commissioned work um, by state organizations, private industry, and um, fellow researchers here at Qatar University and, and elsewhere. A wide range of substantive areas, which we'll get into a, a little bit, um, are covered by um, the surveys conducted at Cessary, including controversial subjects. So it's not just the case that we're sort of studying um, things that are innocuous politically or socially or whatever. I mean, there are a lot of um, substantive interests of, of people at the center. So I want to talk a little bit about what we mean by public opinion or studying public opinion in the Gulf region, especially in a place where people don't always associate, let's say, um, mass attitudes as being part of the decision-making process. Um, so one of the ways we might think about it is at a primary level, which is basically descriptive statistics, 35% um, of people agree that it'd be a good idea to bomb uh, IS in Iraq or, or whatever you want to say. The secondary level, which offers some basis for comparison to situate the data. Um, so maybe 35% of people think it's a good idea to bomb IS in Iraq. Okay, well, is that high or low? Is that, what was it a year ago? What do people in other countries think? So um, there's a secondary level, which is more informative um, that helps us get at that. And then finally, there's a tertiary level, which I'll spend the most time talking about, um, which is beyond the specific result on a particular question or a particular topic, um, what is it that explains that, um, that result, either at the country level or the individual level? So not what is the result, but why? Why do people think a certain way um, rather than how? I think we have some seats over here if, if people are still looking for, um, for places. So it's clear um, that there are limitations associated with the primary level of analysis. Um, again, just you know, what, what does a proportion of, of Qataris or, or expatriates living in Qatar or migrant laborers think on a particular topic? In the first case, it's very hard to field timely survey questions when something is relevant or when it's very relevant. 
Um, it's difficult logistically because things um, take a while to um, progress, but also can be difficult uh, politically as well to field topics. So I have, for example, a, t uh, a survey funded by um, the NPRP pro program of QNRF, which studies um, golf citizen attitudes, so a survey of all six golf publics um, toward GCC integration. As you can imagine, a survey about GCC integration coming from Qatar sponsored indirectly by the Qatari government is very difficult now to field, even though theoretically it might be a very interesting time to do it. Um, and so we're sort of trying to find partners in Emirates and other places that are willing to field that survey. Um, and again, the findings are out of context and difficult to interpret. So when you read in the newspaper, for example, that 55% of people agree with that, is that high or is that low? It doesn't, it doesn't really tell you anything. Um, and again, the more interesting thing is, why do people, why do 55% of people think that? Who are the 55% of, who are the 45 that don't think that? And who are the 55 that do think that? What are the characteristics that describe those two types of people? Um, because that's where you get at the more interesting um, questions. So here's a specific example. Um, so this is a question that we've asked since 2010, right before um, the events of the Arab Spring. We asked it every year since then. I don't have the most recent data from 2014, but we've asked it. Um, the question is, what is the most threatening country to the Arab world, to the Gulf region, and then to Qatar? This is the, the results from, from Qatar. So if you were looking simply at um, summer 2010, for example, 19% of um, Qatari respondents, these are all Qatari respondents for this survey, um, say that Israel is the most threatening country. 17% say Iran. 8% is USA. 44% um, say nobody's threatening, and 8% refuse the question. Again, if you're looking at isolation at one year, what does that mean? What does it mean that 19% of people think that Israel is a, a, a greater threat, um, or sorry, the, the biggest threat to um, the country? But when we compare to previous waves, we see that, in fact, something very interesting happens, which is after the events of, um, of 2011 and the sort of ramping up of sectarian rhetoric and sectarian feeling in the Gulf, you see that threat perceptions um, change in a very uh, predictable or a very sort of systematic way, which is that um, Iran emerges as much greater threat in the public imagina imagination just in one year. Um, it doubles in, in, in incidents. Again, this question is, is it open-ended question? It's not saying, okay, is it this, is it that, is it that? It's simply name the country. Um, and on the other hand, the percentage of people who say that no country is a threat, the, 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 it decreases in proportion essentially to the, the amount that Iran increases. So by looking at additional waves of data, we get to start and connecting it to contemporaneous events. Um, we start to learn something more interesting than just, you know, 8% of people think the U.S. is a threat to the country. Now, we can go at an even deeper level of this data. So, even though uh, a relatively small proportion of, of respondents think the United States is the greatest threat to, um, to Qatar, when you look at the characteristics of the people that fall into each of these categories, we find that this is a very interesting category of people. Because whereas um, the perceptions towards domestic politics among the other threat groups are more or less the same, the people who identify the United States as the greatest threat have very different views. In this case, this is the amount of confidence in government institutions, Qatari government institutions. We see it's lower in 2011, and by 2012, much lower than any of the other groups. And by association, those people who think that there are no country, uh, there's no country threatening um, Qatar is, is higher confidence, which you might expect. So when we look at additional questions, we find something similar. This question is, um, to what extent do you agree that citizens should always support government decisions even if they disagree with them? Again, the other cases are relatively in line with each other, but those people who identify the US or the West as the greatest threat have very, let's say, negative um, views of, of this question, or they, they're much more um, combative or, or oppositional in their opinion. Finally, giving people more say in important government decisions is first or second national priority. We see again, 
people with um, Western or US uh, threat on their mind have much more, um, are much more likely to want greater popular say in important government decision. So what's behind this? In 2011, 2012, the US and Qatar um, formed a much closer diplomatic relationship, or they were seen as having a rapprochement compared to in the past. And there was some rumbling amongst popular, uh, the local population about this, in particular the influence of Western uh, military and, and political um, in the United States. So we're getting to the tertiary level behind simply the original um, results here about threat perceptions. Another case is a more recent study, which is um, something funded by QNRF again. It's asking Qatari citizens about their satisfaction with specific government benefits. So not just in the aggregate, sort of how satisfied are you with things the government provides, but with retirement benefits, land allotment, job opportunities, marriage allowance, K through 12 education, free medical care, universal education. How satisfied are you with each of these things? And we see that, generally speaking, people tend to be pretty satisfied. Um, there's some variation. For example, retirement benefits um, has a relatively higher uh, percentage of people who say they're not satisfied. But again, not everybody's getting retirement benefits, so it's sort of hard to compare. So does that mean that we don't really learn anything because it seems like people seem to be pretty satisfied and that's not very interesting? Well, who are the, what is that that determines how satisfied you are? So one thing you can do is look at um, what are the, let's say, correlates to satisfaction with, with public benefits? On the one hand, um, it could be the cost of living. Because if you think the cost of living is very high, then the benefit that you get, your perception of how much utility there is there, is going to be lower than somebody who perceives a cost of living that's fairly low. And people who believe that their, cost, their public benefits are more or less in line with the benefits other people are receiving, people who have perceive a high degree of equality in the economy, again, you might think that they have a higher satisfaction. And that's exactly what you find. When you ask questions about equality in um, public sector hiring, for example, or sorry, private sector hiring between citizens and expatriates, and about the prevalence of WASTA in making um, important decisions, you see that the people who perceive a high cost of living and a high inequality have a much lower satisfaction with state benefits, even though their income, if you control for their income, is the same. So people for the same income level, the person who perceives a high amount of inequality in the economy and a high cost of living, it translates into a different amount of satisfaction with, with what they receive um, from the state. So again, something that might seem like it's not necessarily interesting um, can actually tell a lot more than, than it seems at first. So a single data point, um, a s data situated within temporal or societal context. Thing of interest is not responses to a specific question, but relationships between responses and other variables. And finally, a th not, I don't know what comes after tertiary, quaternary, or, or some other uh, descriptor. Something that could be very interesting from surveys and something we just finished doing is looking at the very interaction between the interviewer and the respondent himself. In this case, we did a field experiment just last summer in our phone center looking at the impact of country nationality. Um, as I'll talk about later, for social and economic reasons, there are very few Qataris nationals employed as field interviewers. We might think that that's a problem because we're asking citizens about their opinions on sometimes sensitive topics. And so it's a question whether or not the answers we receive are, are, um, are reliable. And so what we did is we had a group of Qatari students and a group of non-Qatari students um, split a sample randomly of, um, of 1,000 Qatari respondents to compare their answers on um, certain questions. And we found that, in fact, it's not across the board. And it's actually not on the types of questions that you might perceive as being very sensitive. For example, political questions, where you see a discrepancy in the answers given to Qataris versus answers given to non-Qataris. It's actually on social questions that touch on the issue of expatriate national divide. So on things about, um, for example, the, um, the relative benefits that should be given to um, public sector employees, non-national public sector employees compared to 
Qatari public sector employees for, for one instance, as well as relaxation of naturalization laws and, and things that qualify for um, citizenship, for example, the, the children of Qatari mothers. So it's actually the cases where um, the issue itself touches on the interaction between um, non-nationals and nationals that shows a sensitivity, not just sort of um, general political questions. For example, one of the questions was, um, how worried are you about government surveillance of your communications, which is a, a question that's been asked before in the World Value Survey. There was no difference in response to countries versus non-countries on that. Um, finally, and I know there'll probably be some questions about um, the modalities of, of conducting surveys in, in Qatar and, and sort of how we go about things in practice, and, and I'm happy to answer that as well. Um, the question is, what does it mean to have public opinion in, um, in a non-democratic context where typically um, the popular views on a subject are not solicited for input into the decision-making process? Um, I think this event that I mentioned in Kuwait, there was a very negative view of public opinion surveys. Why are you doing all these surveys? Nobody listens to us anyway, the, the, the Gulf citizens would say. And in fact, there is a newfound appreciation in, in the Gulf region in particular, um, including at the elite level for survey research, because it's seen A as objective rather than sort of partisan or coming from um, simply um, ideological standpoints. It's based in empirics. Um, and also because people see the value in staying ahead of, of, of public opinion, right? And so in fact, we're seeing new um, efforts in Oman, for example. Um, here in Qatar, we have um, Sesri. In the Emirates, you have um, uh, the Strategic Center for Studies, whatever this is. Um, and in Bahrain, until recently, you also have a, a survey research center. So in fact, um, there is interest in the region, including at the elite level, for honest data on the views of citizens. Um, another thing is, well, how can you ask Gulf nationals this question or this question and expect to get an honest answer? People, you know, that's not part of our culture. We don't, we can't have people coming to our house and asking us sensitive questions. I mean, I think that's akin to this, the idea that, you know, the Gulf or the Arabs aren't ready for democracy, right? Well, you can't just tell them uh, that they have to believe and behave in a certain way and come and expect that um, all people will have these uh, universal values. I think people are much more less sensitive than you assume, and they're much more welcoming of being able to give their views on important topics than, than, um, than is often assumed. This was my experience in Bahrain and also in Qatar. At the end of each of our surveys, we have an open-ended open question, which is something like, thank you for participating in the survey. Do you have anything to add? And if you look at those questions, as I did for one particularly sensitive political survey, um, we were looking for responses like, oh, you shouldn't be asking these questions, or you know, uh, why are you doing this sort of research? And in fact, most of the responses, vast majority, were something like, why didn't you get into the tough issues? Why did you not talk about this? Why didn't you talk about that? Some people were saying, oh, the state should forgive my loan. The state should um, uh, do this and that and the other thing. And so I think um, there's a tendency to think that, to self-censor or to think that people aren't ready to answer tough questions when in reality it's, it's not the case. The main challenge is in fact, um, in Qatar, our demographic. Um, we have this need for separate sampling frames as, as I mentioned earlier because we have different populations living in different areas and multiple translations for the expatriate populations, not just English and Arabic, but Filipino, Urdu, Nepali, Hindi, um, and, and I think we do seven or eight different translations for our, our multi-population surveys. Again, we have very few national field interviewers, so to the extent that um, that presents issues on particular topics, um, that's an issue that we're looking to overcome. And finally, uh, the adult Qatari population, 18 and older, is not infinite, and it's in fact quite small. Even now, we are uh, running to the case of declining response rates where each household now has been sampled at least once in household surveys within five years of a survey research institute. So this year, actually, my proposal for the NPRP is to do a survey on country attitudes toward and participation in surveys to see <laughs> sort of what is, you know, what's the state of the land. People ask me sometimes abroad, oh, are you the only people doing surveys in, in Qatar? And I say, well, the, the 
cut our statistical authority certainly does surveys, but as for other people, to be honest, I don't know, because a lot of people are doing phone surveys. It could be that people are doing household surveys, but there, it's clear that there's a profusion of this sort of research, and very soon, uh, people are going to get tired of answering their cell phones and, and knocks on the door. Um, and so we need to sort of um, temper, our, uh, temper our use, I think. That's all. And um, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>